the book of Amos. And uh, he was one of the two prophets to the northern kingdom. He was contemporaneous with Hosea. And uh, we are in the fifth of five sessions, wrapping up the remainder of chapter 9. And uh, you may recall I had an introduction of a couple of verses, of course. And then we had eight judgments. And he, he, he opened this thing by having, denouncing judgments on heathen nations, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. And uh, then he shifted judgments on Judah, the southern kingdom. But this was really his trial balloons because his real target was, of course, Israel, the northern house. When I use Judah here, I'm talking about the southern kingdom and judgment on Israel, the northern kingdom, the two halves after the civil war uh, when Solomon died. And so, so after going through a sort of a, a light touch of judgments on all the surrounding areas, he's then going to focus on Israel, and he then turns to three sermons of judgment on the northern kingdom. I noticed the top group, of course, were the heathen nations. The three sermons of judgments we went through uh, in the previous chapters. In, uh, we got to chapter 8. We had gone through four of the five visions of judgment. The locusts, which identify Gog the king, and a bunch of others. Then we got to the, la the first ten verses of chapter 9 were a vision of some stricken doorposts. And we're going to zero in tonight on what I regard as the climax of the whole piece, and that's the re restoration of the Davidic kingdom. And that may surprise many New Testament Christians as to what that's really all about. So let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, well, just by quick review, we'll review the ten verses of chapter 9. And Amos records, he says, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar. Strange place to stand, but okay. And he said, smite the lintel of the door and the post that may shake. Cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with a sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away that he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Standing upon the altar. And uh, this is, uh, he is at meaning, he's standing beside the altar, obviously. And what's in view here is the destruction of the temple. And uh, now it's interesting, a number of the, uh, the, the commentators, Cyril, Ewald, Hitzig, Hoffman, Bauer, Jameson, they believe this is referring to Israel's altar and temple along with the golden calf at Bethel up north. Calvin, Fairburn, Kyle, others feel it's the altar and temple at Jerusalem. It turns out either one of these fit history. Because Samaria and Bethel did fall in 722 B.C. and Jerusalem fell in 586 B.C. to the Babylonians. So you can apply the passage either way. And different scholars see it either way. It fits in either case. Okay. It's interesting. Only persons from the northern kingdom could hide atop Mount Carmel. So starting at verse 7, the restoration of the entire nation is in view. There are no fugitives. No one effectively flees the force of the calamity. There are no refugees. No one finds refuge or safety after the calamity. And uh, reminds me sort of the fugitive and refugees. It's like the difference between an idiot and a maniac. Do you know what the difference between an idiot and a maniac is? Uh, the uh, the uh, Idiot is the one driving too slowly in front of you, and the maniac is the guy that's passing you. See? <laughs> Moving on. Verse Though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. In other words, what is basically saying, there's no escape from the judgment of God. And when, it says, when they say dig into hell, the word in the Hebrew is sheol. Not the, that's not a grave, that's the, uh, the, the Greek equivalent of Hades. And I won't go through a whole thing on that here, except to call your attention to the distinctives there, if you will. But in any case, uh, uh, the uh, uh, hell is the, the domain of the departed spirits. A grave is the, is the, the dead body. You can own a grave, you, and it also can be in plurals. Sheol is never in plural, and nobody owns it. It's a, so, but it's not hell in the contemporary sense, it's it's, it's, it's Sheol or Hades in the, in the Hebrew or the Greek. Anyway, incidental here, because the main idea here is no matter where you try to go, you, can get, you cannot escape judgment of God. In other words, you must repent and come to the true altar of yod And Paul quotes all this in Romans 10. On it goes. And salvation is available through obedience and faith. And that's even in Psalm 139. That's not just a New Testament thing. Moving on, verse 3. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out, thence though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, 
Thence will I command the serpent, and he shall bite them. Okay. Now, Mount Carmel is about 60 square miles at the summit, with about 30 square miles available for hiding. And uh, this is a Hebrew parallelism, if you will, for heaven and Sheol in the previous verse. Just in other words, you, uh, just creating some limits. You can't you go to whatever limits you think, God is still there. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword and it shall slay them, and I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. And uh, you can some contrast from your Genesis studies. Remember Joseph was uh, he was uh, as Potiphar's sl slave was safe from his brothers. Uh, they regarded it as hatred, but he regarded it, it was it was good and so forth. Evil and not for good. Deuteronomy 28. 27 deals with all of that. The New American Standard uses the term vaulted dome, incidentally. Amos is going to use the term, God created his bundle over the earth. The sky, the air, the clouds, and so forth. It's a bundle that is knotted together by the hand of the Creator. And uh, from here we, get in, we could get into a whole side thing of beyond uh, perception, uh, beyond uh, our, our, the boundaries of our reality. Super strings and what have you doesn't matter. The concept is wherever you go, God is beyond that. Let's move on. The Lord God of hosts is He that toucheth the land, and it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. The Lord God of hosts. That's quite a title. Adonai, Yorivave, Sivioth. The host. It's the Lord Yahweh, by, as some people would say it, Yahweh of hosts. Hosts being the armies. And uh, rising and falling of the Nile is it, it, the holy like a flood of Egypt. The Nile rises and flood. It, 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 the excavations in Samaria, by the way, discovered images of Isis and Horus, the wife and son of Osiris, the Nile god. One of the strange things about the northern kingdom as it got into idolatry is its preoccupation with Egyptian uh, idolatry, interestingly enough. And that's why these illusions here ring for a, north, to, you know, for a northern kingdom uh, focus, if you will. And uh, they had a fascination with Egypt practices, which is a practice of worship of death. Not life, death. Visit the Cairo Museum, and their whole hi ancient history of Egypt was preoccupation with mummies and death and so forth. We serve a God of the living, not the dead. It is he that bindeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth, he that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Lord yod heh vav -Heh. The, the four letters, the tetragrammaton, unpronounceable according to the rabbis. So many rabbis will just pronounce the letters. yod heh vav -Heh is the name. Others will pronounce it as Yahweh, and others refuse to pronounce it. will use the word Adonai in its place. But fine, whichever. I found his troop in the earth. And uh, so... The word is akudah. It's a, it's a troop in the earth. It's, a, it's like a knot or a bundle, as of hyssop. A troop of men bundled or knotted together. And uh, like the arch of heaven knotted together is perhaps the, the uh, visualization here. Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Camp Flor, and the Syrians from Kir? And uh, so what's, what we're going to start getting into here then is the... From the, uh, from the indictment of the northern house that's been going on for now many chapters, we're going to start shifting to the future restoration of the righteous kingdom. How could God remove Israel in the light of Exodus 12 and 20? Ten commandments and all that. How can he, re how can he remove Israel? He's, he's pledged to them. Israel repeatedly broke his covenant, and her repeated sinfulness suspended the bond of special ownership and privilege. That's why in Hosea, the first few chapters, is where God says, you're not my people. There'll be a time when you're not my people. But before that book ends, they're restored, of course. But it continues here. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. Now there's a shift of idiom here. When he's talking about the sinful kingdom, the focus has been on the northern kingdom, which gets wiped out saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. When you say the house of Jacob, that's both of them. Because both Esau, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 correction, uh, um, the house of Jacob embraces the whole nation. Okay, not Judah or North. 
He doesn't say the house of Judah. He says the house of Jacob. He's saying the whole nation will not be destroyed. You got to, and I like to get this in here because it causes a lot of confusion. The northern kingdom consisted of the territories of ten tribes. It didn't consist of the people of those ten tribes. Why? The northern kingdom went into idolatry. And in 1 Chronicles 11, it points out how the Levites up there got out of there and went south. They went where it was politically correct to worship the temple, at the temple. Likewise, others up north in the various places that wanted to be faithful to Jerusalem moved out of there. It doesn't say this, but you can naturally presume that people in the south that wanted to go into idol worship went where idol worship was politically correct. So there's a commingling of the people. Doesn't change the name. Visualize California and Nevada. If there was some big migration crisscrossing that border, being a Nevadan means you live in Nevada. It doesn't mean you were originally there. In other words, don't confuse when they say Ephraim or uh, 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 whichever tribe. You need to understand where they're talking geographically. Fine. Those are the areas that were given to uh, Naphtali and the various, you know, the 12 tribes, ele the 11 tribes. But if you're talking about people, you're generally talking about their ethnology. What tribe are they of? That gets commingled, if you follow me. When you get to the New Testament, you've got people there that recognize Christ that are from the, the tribe of Asher, northern kingdom. They knew what tribe they're from. Don't confuse that with the fact that the house of the, uh, Israel was obliterated from history. Okay, moving on. But here the scope suddenly broadens to the whole house of Jacob, that is the nation in total. And that's because of, for the sake of their fathers, and that's covered in Romans 11 all through there. Amos continues, For lo, I will command and I will si sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Sifted in a sieve. Strange phrase. A sieve is sort of a device to separate and aerate the grain, removing the bad kernels from the other impurities. The northern kingdom drew out the false worshipers and averted the true worship, it drove the uh, true worshipers south for a while. So that was useful from that point of view. God would not let one repentant person perish. That's emphasized in Deuteronomy 30, by the way. In fact, when you study the book of Revelation, you find the 144,000 that are sealed in chapter 7. They're, not one of them fails to make it to chapter 14. They're sealed. That's what sealing means. Okay. Continuing verse 10, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake or prevent us. Well, you're wrong about that. Okay, the, the, at this point, we've caught up to where we left off last time. Okay, at verse 10 of chapter 9. Okay. Now we're going to see the Davidic kingdom restored. That's the main focus. Starting at verse 11, there's a shift here. Notice verse 11 is the key verse in the whole book, as far as I'm concerned. I'll show you why. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof. I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. There's a very strange phrase in this verse. The tabernacle of David. Don't confuse that with the temple of Solomon. A tabernacle is a palace of a king. In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. There's probably, I'm guessing, one Christian in ten that has any idea what that's about. I'll show you why. Now this, this the tabernacle of David has fallen, and uh, the word there is sukkah in the singular, not in plural like it is in the uh, Feast of Booths and all that sort of thing. This verse is quoted by James in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. The pivotal event in the book of Acts is the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. That's where they're debating, does, what, does a Christ, what does a Gentile have to do to become a Christian? Does he have to keep the Jewish law? The early Jewish church assumed they did, and Paul and Peter went there to straighten that out, and James finally, he's chairing the whole thing, 
there are two different issues that are before that council. Many people, everybody knows the first one. What does a Gentile have to do to become a Christian? Most people miss the second issue that's lurking behind that. If a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to become a Christian, the implied question emerges, what's to become of Israel? And James answers that, and we're going to take a look at that here shortly. The tabernacle of David is not to be confused with the temple of Solomon. I want, when you study your Bible, you'll discover there are a lot of covenants, but there are four that are unique because they're unconditional. Usually a covenant is like a contract. If you do this, I'll do this. Each one, each side has a condition. There are four of these that are unconditional covenants. The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. The land covenant, Genesis 15. And the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. And the everlasting covenant, which is profiled in Jeremiah 31.31. Each one of these has an adversary. Who's the adversary of the Abrahamic covenant? The world. It's called anti-Semitism. The Holocaust was the world's reaction to the plight of the Jew. Challenged by the world. The land covenant has an adversary. Who's the adversary to Israel's right to the land? Islam. Islam. Don't say Arab because you've got to include the Persians. They're Hamites, Japhites, and Sethites all among those that are in Islam. So it's a broad... The, word, the press uses the term Arab, but the press is illiterate. The issue is Muslim, Islamic, independent of ethnology. Who is the adversary of the Davidic covenant? The church. About nine out of ten churches hold an eschatology, a view of the end times, which attempts to allegorize much of scripture. And they don't believe in a literal millennium. They see the millennium in Revelation 20 as simply an allegorical device. And they're in for a shock. And I'll explain why before we're through. But in that sense, the average Christian so-called reform or covenant theology, whatever you want to label it, does not recognize that the Davidic covenant, that the millennium is simply the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. So we're going to take a look at this one in detail because it's highlighted not just in Amos 9, but throughout the New Testament. 2 Samuel 7. Let's understand the Davidic covenant. It's recorded in 2 Samuel 7. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, God speaking to, to Nathan here, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and I have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight. I have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And that's all through the scripture, the Davidic covenant. He continues in verse 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. You know what that means in the Hebrew? Forever. <laughs> I want to shift here a moment to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. You all know it because you see it on Christmas cards every year. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. For unto us a child is born, 
right? For unto us a son is given. This is an example of Hebrew parallelisms. They look like they're just saying the same thing two different ways. No, they're not. My personal professional background is in the information sciences. And I've come to the conclusion, studying the Bible, that there are no synonyms. Two words may be synonymous in that they mean almost the same thing. Watch out for that word almost. Often a subtle difference hides a discovery. That's called, the rabbis would call that a remez, a hint of something deeper. They regard that as a signpost. Dig here, there's a treasure hidden. Anytime you find a detail or a, 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 a pun of some kind, check it out. Because it very likely there's something hidden behind that. And I'll tell you something else. That which is hidden behind them will always be a specific subject. You know what that subject is? The Messiah. Now here we have, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Those are not the same thing. A child is born is human. A child is born is human. That occurred in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And unto us a son is given. That's deity. And that occurred at Golgotha. So they're not the same thing. But this verse goes on in verse 7. Of the increase of his government peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, there is that strange phrase again. And upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know, some people will say, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. We live in the New Testament. Really? Watch this. Let's talk about the New Testament. It confirms this in the Annunciation in Luke 1, it, in the Ascension in Acts 1, at the Council for Jerusalem in Acts 15, seven kingdom parables in Matthew 13, and in the Millennium in, chapter, in, in uh, Revelation tw chapter 20. Let's take a look at the Ascension. Luke chapter 1. Gabriel talking to Mary. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. You know what that says in the Greek? That forever? You know what it says in the Greek? Forever. Okay. Now I've got news for you, Gabriel. Rome was running things. Where was the throne of the father David then? There was no throne of the Father David then. It, the, 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 the Rome ran things. Has that happened yet? No. Will it? Yes. Let's move on to the ascension. The whole gospel period went forward. We get to Acts chapter 1, right? When they therefore were come together, they ask of him, Jesus is getting ready to ascend here, ask him, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said, uh, you're miscused. I'm not going to do that. Is that what he said? No. Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Many people read that backwards. They say, well, he's not going to do it. No, he's just, he's, he's, they don't know the timing. He's confirming that he will. He's confirming that he will. Will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father put in his own power. Meaning there is a time when that is going to happen. It hasn't yet. That's, okay, let's go to, okay, let's go to, um, well, he continues, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Concentric circles, from Jerusalem, then all of Judea, then in Samaria, the northern kingdom too, and the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that he's going to set it up when he gets back. Okay? Let's take a look at the most, perhaps the most interesting one to us tonight because it involves Amos 9. The Council of Jerusalem. Big brouhaha going on in Judaism. Does it, among the Jewish Christians that were all Jews, they, they heard about all these Gentiles coming to faith. They assumed that they had to keep Shabbat, they had to get circumcised, all the Jewish things. Peter and Paul among others, went to the council to straighten that out. 
And they, did, they got that agreed to, but James, who's chairing the thing, he says, And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And then he quotes here from Amos chapter 9. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will again build the ruins thereof and will set it up. He's quoting Amos chapter 9 verse 11. We'll come back to that when we finish this uh, detour here. But then James continues, That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God in all his works, from the beginning of the world. You know, that's one of my frustrations with uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. I think he did a remarkable job, despite some of the Catholic overtones. I think he did a fantastic job, but it has two defects. It creates the impression that the crucifixion was a tragedy. No, no, it was an achievement that was planned before the foundation of the world. The other thing it fails to do is get across who the guy is. A great teacher, a great example, a miracle worker. No, 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 no. Much more than that. The Creator Himself incarnate. Stepping into His creation to fulfill a destiny that we couldn't earn for ourselves. Wow, that's what it's all about. Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. Okay, then the kingdom parables. I won't go through the seven kingdom parables. I'll just take one verse out of Matthew 13. He answered and said to them, Because it is given to you, unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them is not given. Surprisingly enough, why does Jesus speak in parables? It's not because, it's not to teach. It's to hide. Because it's given to you to know, you the disciples, the insiders, to know about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. He spoke in public. From that Matthew 13 on, he always speaks, when in public, he always speaks in parables. So only the people that are supernaturally enlightened will follow what he's saying. But here's where he says, For, he, he's given to you, unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Here's a phrase that only occurs in Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John don't use the term kingdom of heaven. They use the kingdom of God. Well, they're synonyms. 99 out of 100 commentaries will tell you they're synonymous. I happen not to think so, and I'll show you why. Mysteries of the Kingdom of Heaven, that's the term in the New Testament. It refers to truths that were not revealed in the Old Testament, which are now were made known to those instructed. That's the whole point of Matthew 13, verse 11. If you go out tonight, and there's a clear sky, and you get a cheap telescope and look at a star, you see a bright spot. You go back to the store and buy a really expensive, good telescope and look at that same star, you discover it's actually two stars. There's a property of optics called resolving power. It's ability to discern two things that are very close together. It's called, in optics, it's, it's a mathematically determined a merit, a figure of merit. It also occurs in language. We have two terms here, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Mark, Luke, and John use kingdom of God. Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. In many places, they're talking about the same event. Mark and Luke and John in their way, Matthew in his way. And many people assume, well, he's just using a, a different phrase because he's Jewish. That's naive, if, if I may. The kingdom of God is an all-inclusive term of everything outside God himself. The angels, they were created long before the earth, which was created before the universe, surprisingly enough. But the point is, everything God created is in His kingdom. No problem there. Okay? Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven, and unfortunately the word of and from in, in, in Hebrew and in German, the word of and from are the same word. I'll come back to that. Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven 33 times. Terrific. But notice, Matthew uses the term kingdom of God five times. And once he uses it side by side. In one verse, the next verse, he uses the other. In other words, he uses them. Somebody says, well, that proves they're synonymous. No, it doesn't. It proves the opposite. One is more denotative than the other. The kingdom of heaven is included within the kingdom of God, but Matthew is being more specific. Why? Because that's his mission. The gospel of Matthew is, to, to, is the king, king, kingship of Christ. Mark is his servanthood. Luke is his humanity. And, and, and uh, John his deity. Okay, and that, that's a whole study in itself. Only Matthew uses the term kingdom of heaven. Now, in both Hebrew and uh, German, of and from are the same word. If, my, if I'm auto, 
from Habsburg, my name becomes Otto von Habsburg. Okay, it becomes my name. But it's a genitive of source. It's where I'm from. I'm Chuck from California. You know I'm from California. You don't assume that there's some equivalence between me and California. Follow me? You see? If I said I'm Chuck of California, you think, well, maybe that there's something in both of us. You, you, follow, you follow me? It, in other words, this is a genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. The kingdom is from heaven. When you translate it properly, when it's kingdom from heaven, you don't get confused. When you say the kingdom of heaven, well, it somehow gets in that fuzzy, fuzzy world of what is heaven anyway. You follow me? No, it's a kingdom on the earth. It has locality, it has a king, it has subjects, it has geography. It's on the earth. It's a kingdom from heaven. Special in that regard. And we'll look at that where the Bible explains that all to us. But I want you to be sensitive to that right, away, right off. And so... Back in Daniel chapter 2, you remember the famous polymetallic image? Head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and even the feet are iron mixed with clay. And we had gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Four metals, right? Four principal em uh, uh, empires, one in two phases. I'll come back to that. And, we, uh, iron, iron, and it goes in a mode of iron mixed with clay. A stone cut without hand strikes it at the feet, and grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth. The whole earth, not just the Middle East, right? That was all, remember that? It was all in Daniel chapter 2. Those are kingdoms, okay? How many kingdoms are there? Five. You saw four. He's going to talk about a fifth. The one here that just grew out of that stone. The first one was Babylon. Next one was Persia. Next one was Greece. Then we had Rome in two phases, and most scholars recognize that the, the, the two phases are separated by some, some distance. That fourth empire breaks into pieces, but then recoalesces. That's all, in the, that's all there. Daniel explains all that to us. Babylon was from 606 to 539 when uh, uh, the Persians conquered the Babylonians. The Persians had it until 332 BC when Alexander the Great conquers the Persians. Alexander the Great is finally uh, lost to the Romans in 68. Who conquered Rome? Nobody. It broke into pieces. And those pieces are destined, apparently, to eventually recoalesce. But after you get through those four kingdoms, you get to verse 44 of Daniel 2, and let's read it a little more carefully. And in the days of these kings, now bear in mind what you just saw, you had those four, four different metals, gold, silver, brass, and iron. A stone cut without hands smites it at the feet, it crumbles, and that stone grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth. A mountain being an idiom for government, right? It's explaining this mountain. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I want you to understand that's the fifth kingdom of a list of five. We've talked about the four. This is the fifth one. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Wow. Interesting. In that day, now let's get back to Amos chapter 9. Refresh our memory. What, did, what was James quoting from out of James? Verse 11. In that day will I raise up this tabernacle of David that has fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it again as in the days of old. In that day. That refers to the end time restoration of the nation Israel. It was never fulfilled under Zerubbabel in 536 B.C., never fulfilled under Ezra in 458 B.C., never fulfilled in Nehemiah 445. That's never happened yet. God is going to, first of all, raise up the tabernacle that's fallen. He's going to raise up God's fallen house and rule. He's going to close up the breaches, the walls about Jerusalem. I will raise up His ruins, Restore the land physically and spiritually. And that's mentioned in Isaiah 65, Jeremiah 31, 
Ezekiel 37, the dry bones thing, you know all, the, you know all those. Three chapters in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, and uh, Romans 9 to 11. I will build it again as the days of old. He's going to restore the nation to its grandeur and glory as in the, da in the days of David and Solomon. And if you understand what that was like in those days, you can just, you can't imagine what's going to be like forthcoming here. The problem we have in the Christian church is those that are victims of amillennial perspectives have to allegorize the clear statements of Yodivave in Scripture concerning Israel's restoration. If you're amillennial, you don't know what to do with these prophecies. The, 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 the thing that has to uh, uh, click in is the millennium is simply the fulfillment of the Davidic, pro of the, uh, Davidic covenant. Continuing the next verse. Amos 9.12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Wow, could we depart on tangents here? There isn't probably one Christian in a dozen that knows who Edom is today. Who are the Edomites? A lot of, a lot of well, the Edomites... See, most people don't understand history. They are victims of your little map in the Bible, where you have in the back, you're east of the southeast of the Dead Sea. You know, it goes Ammon, Moab, Edom, that they're southeast of the Dead Sea. No, no, no. The Nabataeans came in and drove them to the west. They went around the Red Sea and they, they created a country called Idumea. That's the Greek term for Edom, that, whose, whose capital was Hebron. And uh, when the Babylonians were taking Jerusalem captive, they cheered them on. They're supposed to be the same family, Esau and Jacob. No, no, they were enemies. There are more judgments, there are more judgments pronounced on Edom than any other group in the entire Bible. What most people don't understand is that after the Maccabean revolt, when the Jews regained suzerainty over that area, John Hyrcanus forced the Edomites to become Jews. So they either fled or were killed or became Jews. To the Roman mind, an Edomite was a kind of Jew. That's why Antipater was appointed uh, Herod, and the Herods, all the, the house of Herods, all of them are Edomites. In the Roman mind, they're a near Jew. To the Jewish mind, they're their traditional enemy. Now, what's interesting is as life goes on, the Edomites then accede to power. Many of the Edomites think they're Jews, but they're actually Edomites. And that's why rabbis usually refer to global governance people as Edomites. Some of the most powerful people in the world that you would think are Jewish are actually Edomites. And Jesus makes reference to them in two places, Revelation 2.9, Revelation 3.9. Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Of the twelve disciples, there was only one that was not a Galilean. Who was he? Where was he from? Iscariot means Kiriot, from Kiriath. Kiriath is just a little south of Hebron. He was an Edomite, whether he realized it or not. Interesting. Anyway, moving on. The bounties will extend to borders that she held under Solomon. That includes Edom and many surrounding lands, and it awaits millennial fulfillment, of course. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman will overtake the reaper and the trader of griefs. Him that soweth the seed, the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. In other words, they'll hardly be able to keep up with the prolific bounty. That's the opposite of what was back in chapter 4 in this passage. And all of this, of course, is post-rapture. I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Wow. I always visualize Yule Brenner saying, so let it be written, so let it be done. <laughs> well, we've talked about the other New Testament confirmations. I won't spend a lot of time on the millennium. You can read that in Revelation 20 yourself. But I want to remind you what Daniel said. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kings and it shall stand forever. The Davidic covenant. The throne of David is going to be reestablished. 
in Jerusalem. And this is also emphasized back to Abraham in Genesis 17, by the way. David is to rule in the millennium. Well, it probably means the son of David. Four times it specifically says David will rule. I believe God means what he says and says, that, why wouldn't he? He's been resurrected. We'll see. We'll see. And this can't be applied to the church for a lot of reasons. And this whole thing is going to apply profound changes on the earth. My, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and he, they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. David, my servant. Some people say, well, that's an idiom for the Mazah. Yeah, I won't argue with that. We'll watch and see. It's interesting to me that if you ever notice sevens in the Bible, seven of, sevens everywhere, right? There's also twelve everywhere. The kingdom of heaven is always in twelves. There are twelve tribes. There are twelve apostles to rule over the twelve tribes, we learn in Matthew 19 and Luke 22. There are twelve kingdom of heaven parables. There are twelve kingdom mysteries. There are twelve thousand sealed from each of the twelve tribes. The new Jerusalem has twelve gates, twelve foundation stones, and it's twelve thousand by twelve thousand by twelve thousand furlongs. Really? Okay. Yeah, there's, see, there's seven kingdom parables in Matthew 13, indeed, but we overlook five others that he adds to give us, again, twelve kingdom parables. How interesting. We have twelve kingdom mysteries, the mystery of the kingdom of God and the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Those are different, interestingly enough. Mystery of the manifestation of the flesh, my, mystery of the salvation by faith. There is mis, uh, the mystery of the ultimate unity of God, the mystery of the Gentiles in the same body, the mystery of the bride of Christ, the mystery of the harpazo, or the rapture as we call it, the mystery of iniquity, which does already work, he tells us, and the mystery of the seven churches, and the mystery of Israel's blindness, and the mystery of Babylon. There's twelve of these. And when you get to Revelation 10, guess what? The mysteries are finished. How interesting. Fun stuff. When you get to the book of Ezekiel, you find that this temple, I'll call it the Tabernacle of David, the temple is laid out, the basic core of it is very familiar. If you understand the architecture of the tabernacle, it replicates that in a very similar way. Except as you look at this, there's additional gates for there's things for sinners, singers, and then there's priest chambers, and then there's kitchens for the priests, and the, the, the inner gates, these are all specified to the inch. In such detail, you can't possibly allegorize this. They, they have the inner gates, and then you have the outer gates. And there's a lot of confusion about the darkness that's outside the outer gates, the outer darkness. Many people don't understand what that is. There's a big controversy about that. And the uh, chambers of the outer court. And then we have people's kitchens. I'm glad to see that. And uh, then the outer gates. And the darkness outside is a phrase used three times by Matthew in a very peculiar way, having to do the wedding feast. I won't get into that here. Just I just want you to understand that, that your first instinct is not necessarily the correct one when you get into the exegesis of that phrase. What about sacrifices? That bothers a lot of people. We need to understand that animal sacrifice never took away human sin. Only the sacrifices of Christ can do that. In the Old Testament times, Israel's were saved by grace through faith. The sacrifice helped restore the believer's fellowship with God. Second, even after the church began, Jewish believers did not hesitate to take part in temple worship. They could do this because they viewed the sacrifice as memorials of Christ's death. And those memorials can occur before and they can occur after. The millennial sacrifice will differ from Levitical sacrifice, though there will be some similarities, and that's all in Ezekiel 45. And there are other passages that refer to sacrificial system in the millennium. It sounds strange, but it's well in the scripture and it's, it's understandable. The land covenant was promised to uh, Abraham, and that's never been rescinded. And, but it was, their, using it, their blessing of it was conditioned upon their obedience. But her right to possess the land has never been revoked. When God inaugurates his new covenant with Israel in the future, she'll be restored to her place of blessing in the land. That's Ezekiel 36 through 37. And to prepare people for this new occupation, God defined the boundaries of the country, Israel's boundaries during the borders of the millennium will be similar to those promised to her during the time of Moses in Numbers 34. The holy district is well described. It's about 25,000 cubits on a side. The temple is in the middle of this. It's not in Jerusalem. It's substantially to the north. The living quarters for the sons of Zadok are around that. The Levites are no longer officiating in the temple. They're menials. 
but they're there to serve in, in minor ways. Jerusalem is to the south. There's food growing areas assigned. There's a portion for the prince on each side of the holy district. And we have waters flowing from the temple. Then the division of the land. We have the different tribes inherit zones in the land, all described in Ezekiel 48. This is literal stuff. You, they're not allegories. And uh, you can approximate it looking at a chart, but the topology is going to change so dramatic, dr dramatically, I wouldn't make too much of that right now for, for a lot of reasons. And uh, for what it's worth, that's the perspective of most scholars. It may be correct, maybe not. Eight mi it's over eight miles on a side. That's a sizable portion. We've, my wife and I have written a book called The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, which goes into all of this, and it's accompanied with briefing packs on the various subjects of thy kingdom come. What does that really mean? What's the origin of evil in the first place? There's a whole two-hour study on eternal security. Until you nail that down, you'll be encumbered from witnessing. You need to know where you stand before you can re really uh, be effective for others. And there's a difference between inheritance and, re and uh, reward. You want to understand what that all means. We've, uh, when you talk about eschatology, the real tragedy in the Christian body is that you, your first why on the road is you're either amillennial or premillennial. If you take the, the millennium in Revelation 20 seriously, you're considered premillennial. If you allegorize it or think it's just a figure of speech, you would be on the left side of this chart. There are some that used to be around that felt we were already in the millennium, but in recent years that's not been a very popular option. If you're premillennial, you could fall in one of three categories. You, post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, do you believe the church, do you believe that the, the uh, rapture occurs before the tribulation? If so, you're on the right end of this chart. If you think the church goes through the tribulation, you're on the left end of this chart. If you think you're somewhere in between, we'll call that mid-tribulational. But the main point is to understand that most denominations are on the left side of this chart. They're amillennial and they, they thus become post-tribulational. People who take the Bible very seriously, the fundamentalists, as some people call us, are on the right side of this. They're premillennial, premillennial pre-tribulational. And from studying the Bible, that's the only way you can rationalize and put together all the pieces of the puzzle. And that's the real key. Don't be, don't want, you want to avoid one verse theology. Every piece should be fitting in to all the rest of the other pieces. That's the test. Now the thing I want, the reason I bring this up here, if you tell me your hermen hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation, where you sit on that line on the bottom of the chart will tell me if you're on the left, if you're willing to allegorize scripture, you'll swing to the left side of that chart. If you take the, if you believe the Bible is inerrant, that every number, every letter, every place name is there deliberately and for relevance, you are on the right side of this. If I know your theory of interpretation, I know where you'll come out eschatologically. Okay? Now, what, there is a thing I call the epistemo epistemology, the study of knowledge, its scope and its limits. Hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. Your theory of interpretation determines your eschatology, your study, your beliefs about the end times. That's what's sort of demonstrated by that little chart I just showed you. Well, your eschatology determines your ecclesiology. You really won't understand the ecclesia, the church, the mystical church, until you really understand your eschatology. And that really comes home to roost when you study Revelation 2 and 3. When you begin to understand those seven churches lay out a history of the church from Ephesus through Laodicea, you then have, you, it's from your eschatology, you begin to have a grasp of your ecclesiology by really studying uh, the details of that. Well, your ecclesiology will determine your hermeneutics. Because that will determine what versions are you comfortable with. Do you deal with paraphrases? That's fine devotionally, but you will miss a lot of the wordplay and a lot of the precision that's it, that God has intended in the text. And uh, we stick with the King James, not because it's better, the problems are just better understood. They're well documented. It also has a majesty which uh, uh, is enamoring, and it also is a version, you know it's going to be around 20 years from now, so if you do memory work, it's nice to do it in something you know is going to be around. All these other modern ones get eclipsed by other modern ones. Now we're very impressed with the International Standard Version Bible that's going to be released formally next year. It's just coming out, and uh, the founder of that uh, activity will be speaking to the conference this, uh, uh, shortly. 
and uh, we're under, uh, exploring the possibility of doing a study Bible in the ISV with all our materials, an electronic version of that. So we're exploring that. But in any case, hermeneutics, eschatology, ecclesia, they all point to Christ. That's the key. He's, the, he's, he's what it's all about. First, last, and always. Praise God. So I want to give you your challenge. I like to put this at the end because you, you come here and you spend time learning a few verses about the Bible. But I want to put a challenge on the board, which if you accept, it's a preposterous statement, I happen to believe it's true, but if you accept it, you flunk the course. I'm putting this up here because I want, you to, I want to challenge you. I think you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. Now, We've just finished a chapter in uh, Amos where it describes in advance the details of the collapse of the northern kingdom. And it did, just the way it happened. I mean, it's just the way it's described, what's the way it happened? Well, the Bible has a great deal to say about the time that we're moving into. You want to know what's going to happen? Find out what the Bible says about it. Now, if you accept that, you flunk, because I want to, to challenge this statement. You've got to do two things. First thing you've got to do is find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says or anybody else. You need to find out what you believe the Bible says. Find out for you. It's too important. Your eternity depends on it. And you can't delegate that to others. And we have a unique environment today. The Word of God is more available to us today than it's ever been in the history of man. Ten or twenty years ago, there were questions you might have that you'd have to get a pastor to answer for you. Not anymore. You can get at the original text. You can go into the Greek or Hebrew without knowing Greek or Hebrew with a computer. You click on any word, it'll pop up and tell you all about that word in the original. The advanced information appliances you and I share, whether it's in your phone or your laptop or your desk uh, computer, is astonishing. Astonishing. When I was the Ford Motor Company, I was responsible for the Ford Motor Computer Center. Our rental bill to IBM was over $100 million a year. I have more computer power in my laptop than I was responsible for when I was responsible for the Ford Motor Center back in 1966. Now, that was a long time ago, especially in computer terms. But it's astonishing. I, I was part of a classified project to create an optical memory that was a, a terabit, 10 to the 15 bits, considered unimaginable. And you can now buy them for less than $200 at your local store. Terabit memories. Trillions and trillions and stuff. Almost as much dollars as the government spends. <laughs> and the internet. Do you realize that all of man's knowledge is only a few keystrokes away? Every piece of man's knowledge is available to you if you know how to use your keyboard. The internet is unbelievable. There's a lot of junk on there, of course. A lot of foolishness. But there is an awesome store of treasures. But the way you're going to grow isn't on the internet alone. You want to be in a small group. I've studied the Bible for 65 years. The place I've seen people grow is in small groups meeting during the week, not on Sunday morning in Sunday school or in a, from a 45-minute sermon once a week. No, 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 no. That's good, but that's not, not, that's not, that's what a math is necessary, but not sufficient. You want to be meeting during the week in a small group for the purpose of expositional Bible study. And you don't have to be a teacher to lead one. If you can't find one, if you can, join it. If you can't find one, start one. You don't have to be a teacher to lead one. All you have to do is play a DVD, bring, invite a few people over for coffee and donuts, and talk about it. The Holy Spirit will take over. All you have to do is lead it so it doesn't, you know, one person doesn't dominate, all that sort of thing. Just, you have to facilitate it. You don't have to know the material. The second thing you got, that's the first thing. Find out what the Bible says. The second thing is find out what's really going on and you won't on the 10 o'clock news. Most Americans have woken up to the reality that their, their media is corrupt. The purpose of the media in a democracy is the, to inform the electorate. If, uh, people are no more free than the free press. And the press has been commandeered by special interest groups. And so we learned that painfully in the last election. 
were not only, it wasn't just that information was biased, it was deliberately withheld from you. That's a, that should be treason. So you need to find out, there are ways to find out, you need to find out how to do that. Pilate said, what is truth? That's what I'm asking you tonight, what is true? How do you find out what's true? You've got to do a little homework. Now, I'll acquaint you with some resources that you may not be aware of. We live in the age of deceit. You need to know what to do in, in it. In any case, what's your action plan? Have you just, uh, uh, what's God, how many of you are saved? Is he a show of hands? Why? Why did God save you? To magnify his name. There's a lot of collective, you know, metaphors reign where mysteries reside. Right? There are collective reasons he saved you, of course. There's also specific ones. Every one of us in this room has a calling, a specific calling. It's not all the same, we're all different. The discovery of that calling is the greatest adventure in your life. To find out what it is specifically He has positioned you for. What is God calling you to do? Find out. That's the most exciting thing you'll ever do. Every one of, this room, of us in this room, me included, are works in progress. One year from now, will we have grown or will we have atrophied? One year from now, where will we be spiritually? I'm going to suggest every one of us should raise the bar on our personal walk. Now that can include a lot of different things. There might be some baggage we should get rid of, whatever. But raising that bar on our performance, so to speak, will include, among other things, committing to a systematic study of the Word of God. Some people can do that alone. Most of us do better in a small group. A group small enough that you can ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough that you hold each other accountable to some level. So either join or start a small study group. But whatever it is that God called you to do, do it now. Do it today. Did you know Satan loves tomorrow? Tomorrow is when the fools repent. Tomorrow is when the sloth will work. Tomorrow is when we start the diet, right? <laughs> no, the, what Satan hates is today. Committing now and meaning it. Respond to his calling now. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.